What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly. And today, I'm going to be doing a bit of an odd job kind of episode. Um, Not too long ago, I conducted a series of episodes with a group of creators. Um, Everyone from... Paul Cornell, uh, Stephen Bulk, uh, Dave Moody, Grady Hendricks, uh, and some others as well. So a, f- a few of the people that, and the idea was that I was going to pull together a documentary style episode around a set of five or six questions, looking at how genre storytelling, so mainly sort of horror and science fiction, um, has changed over the 20th century and to today, looking at things about social acceptance, uh, representation of minorities, both race and sort of uh, gender and sexual orientation, but then also talking about how uh, we introduce children to these concepts as well of horror and science fiction. I tried my best to turn this into uh, a documentary. I tried several times and it's a lot harder than I thought it was. I'm going to return back to this idea uh, at a later date. Um, prob- obviously not with these interviews, but I will come back to this in another way and I'm probably going to try and get some help to do it because I do think there's some real um, legitimacy and some legs to this idea. Um, but in the meantime, I didn't want these interviews to go to waste and uh, they seem relevant for this time of year, talking about post-Halloween, but it's still dark nights. It's still that spooky time of year. So... The next two or three episodes is going to be me introducing um, these interviews. I've sort of been in and edited them, tidied them up a little bit. Um, and they're just the interviews. They are wonderful. Um, and, it, for example, in this episode, uh, you have uh, my interview with Paul Cornell, um, comic book writer, writer of Doctor Who episodes, uh, as well as his uh, series of novels that started with London Falling. Uh, as well as others. I mean, the guy's done a load of stuff. Uh, wonderful guy. Really enjoyed talking to him. Uh, that is then followed by my interview with Stephen Volk. Now, Stephen Volk, uh, from my point of view, initially wrote uh, and created Ghost Watch, the 1992 uh, production that was on the BBC. But he also wrote a series of other things and is also an author of a, several collections of novellas and short stories, uh, all with sort of a gothic and uh, ghostly or supernatural uh, bent um, for the most part excellent excellent interview so let's get right into it the first interview for this podcast is with paul cornell it's sort of broken into sort of several sections and the topics are sort of so the first one uh, to talk about is evolution and acceptance of horror as a mainstream stream genre so really do you think it has become more accepted or is it still maligned or was it ever maligned oh um i think it certainly went through a a phase of maligndness i think what happened was during the 1970s there's a very big mainstream horror boom Mm. lots of lots of big bestsellers lots of big movies we're talking the exorcist we're talking the rise of stephen king we're talking so many uh, paperbacks with embossed covers. We are talking horror is really a central plank of mainstream entertainment in the 70s. And then towards the 80s and 90s, the splatterpunk movement came along and actually managed to alienate a lot of the traditional audiences of horror. And suddenly we went from horror as bestseller to horror not having a section in the book seller, in the bookstore anymore. It's only in recent years that we've started to recover from that. Initially, I think, through the popularity of urban fantasy, which might as well be horror with a sticker on the front saying, protagonists will probably survive. And I think that's right at the heart of it, that do you want a story where you might be plunged right into the heart of darkness and not take it out of it? Or do you want a story where 
uh, but you will actually be able to viscerally triumph over that. And thanks to the lever of urban fantasy, I think horror followed it back into the centre again. And so we're now at a point where once more, um, I mean, Stephen King has never gone away. He's simply that big. But everybody in his wake has risen and fallen and risen and fallen. And I think that with with, um, the recent success of Joe Hill and shows like Walking Dead, we are once more back on in horror being back at the centre of the mainstream again. Talk about urban fantasy. One of the things I, you know, that's a good quite point because I think one of the differences and to what you think of this is, so in horror, like you say, that the 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 protagonist is usually very much under threat and um, I would say you know in an under an underdog position, uh, even if they're not the final girl. But characters, especially at the heart of urban fantasy, seem to be either. Let me say, are they are they stronger, or is it that they actually become a part of that sort of like supernatural and occult world at the end of it? Often, well, it, I think it's a question of where the sense of humour is placed in a certain tradition of horror, the kind of um, famous monsters of filmland tradition of horror. The comedy is at the expense of the protagonists. The protagonists are regarded as basically fodder for the monsters or the the threat of some kind. And this is also um, an element, actually, that um, the mockery of horror, which which is necessary for the mainstream. I mean, The Exorcist is pretty full on, this is real, this is true. But, you know, movies like um, Scream and are a kind of recognition of the fact that slasher movies are there for people to be scared of and then laugh after they're scared horrible as that was for a period there in the 80s uh, because that's very much awful laughter that's very much laughter at what on screen is genuine pain and suffering but uh, the humor then moves with urban fantasy to be on the side of the protagonist so uh, and honestly for the first time i think we can point to a tv show as starting a literary tradition in that funny urban fantasy, urban fantasy with a witty protagonist who's in charge, started with Buffy and swiftly moved into books. And um, so I think it's a question of who does the laughing. And now horror, because that laughter is over there in urban fantasy, horror is back as being quite stately, quite formal, and not mocking itself anymore which I think is is nice. I I, I write both forms, actually. I write Urban Fantasy with my Lichford series, which has a large degree of comedy in it, although the serious bits are serious. But a lot of my short stories um, actually are in the tradition of of what you might call serious horror. Mm. So it's nice that both flavours are now available. I do agree. I think think that you're writing both literature and in sort of uh, film. It's a horrible phrase, but what they call it, like elevated horror... But you've had films uh, that seem to have, t- you know, that seem to have had some sort of mainstream uh, acceptance. Everything from like the Babadook to uh, the Witch, uh, Hereditary, and then sort of uh, Midsummer well, last year, really. Well, it is a really good example of horror as thrill ride mm. in the modern form. Um, that's definitely a mainstream audience pleasing thrill ride, but at the same time. Oh, the position of laughter in it, we're not going to be laughing there. You know, that's, uh, um, in its way, a serious movie. Yeah, that's a good point. So, OK, so the next one then, so for, for this thing, for this transition, you talk about, you know, the move in the 70s into the 80s and the Splatterpunk thing. So so has society changed, has the genre changed, or have both changed that over that period that's created that sort of like up and down relationship? Well, I'm tempted to say 1970s, terrifying and violent and awful and we're all pumped full of lead and i mean lead from petrol and often thus pumped full of lead and now lots and lots of anxiety and fear and in the middle there in the 1990s really quite a little while of us all being blissed out and relatively (laughs) unworried although you know being human beings we still felt scared at the time that seems to map really closely onto horror being popular at both ends. So I think we find uh, an expression, it's the blues, we find an expression for our fear in the depiction of fictional fear. 
Okay, so it's, it's a social anxiety sort of represented on screen and that sort of working its way through. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you've got, I mean, you know, especially the, the most, it's a great film, but on the nose version, I suppose, would be Get Out. Yeah, recently. I mean, that, 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 that consciously mm. takes socially aware horror, and I think that's opened up a whole genre. That's the biggest little big bang since urban fantasy. That's really pulled together, underlined, and created a, a genre. It's one of those. Let's hope Hollywood takes the right lessons from it and doesn't just start pumping out take the take the wrong lessons and start doing something that's you know completely beside the point. The next one, okay, the next one is representation in genre fiction. So this is all uh, all areas really. So again, this comes from this idea that the majority of early genre protagonists were obviously male uh, and you know predominantly sort of like white sort of fantasy characters. Wow, well, 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 well. I I think the presence of women. In the horror audience, as well as in the horror, as horror characters, it has, has always been underestimated. I mean, you could say in the 70s, horror is a women's genre in a lot of ways. They're not writing it necessarily, although of course some are, but they're definitely reading it. It's right next to the Gothic, which is also enormous at that point. And... Um, I think the two audiences definitely shared a lot of books. I mean, look at um, oh, Flowers in the Attic, books like that, um, where yeah, it's hard to tell where the gothic ends and where the horror begins. So I think that there's always been, back then, a, a women audience for uh, horror, but they get shoved away by the very clinical nature of splatterpunk, I think, which is basically... I'm sure there's good splatterpunk. I mean, there there must be, and um, I'm I'm not meaning to diminish an entire genre, but what it did was it was kind of a lads' raid on a women's genre, and, and you know, when, whenever we say female audience and the mainstream, those are basically the same thing. When you appeal to women, you appeal to the mainstream because that's half of the human race. When you don't appeal to women, suddenly your potential audience is half of what it could be. And that's exactly what happened to horror. And I think these days, like with thankfully lots of other areas of culture, we are seeing a conscious effort to allow more diversity and to allow people to write this stuff who didn't write it before. Um, We're also seeing a conscious effort to stop them. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, yeah uh, as you say but um, I, I I think the idea that horror used to be a male genre no, no, not at all what about other areas? Because I mean, one of the things you know, again, actually, to talk about horror, like, you know, going back, going back to like Buffy, um, you know, kicked off a lot of that because I mean, around that era, era, you had like Buffy, there was Dark Angel, there was a few others that were female led. You know, horror and sort of sci-fi shows. Even like Xena, Warrior Princess was, you know, eventually became more successful than like Hercules. I, I agree with what you're saying about them being half the population. But what about other sort of minority groups? So sort of like you know, whether it be, um, you know, a gay, a lesbian, or yeah. uh, ethnic yeah, minorities. Uh, so you know, do you think they've ever been had you know better representation through whether? It, and when I say genre fiction, I suppose I mean everything across sort of like horror, sci-fi, fantasy. Well, well, it it occurs to me that the one aspect of splatterpunk I haven't been talking about is Clive Barker, mm. who was initially viewed as kind of part of that market, which seems ridiculous now because, you know, who's more lyrical and um, as as he swiftly showed with books like Weave World, but you know the books of blood were pretty in your face, and they have a very queer sensibility, so they. Um, there's a queer sensibility in mainstream bookshops right at the end of the horror boom. And, you know, thankfully he he's persisted and he's still part of popular culture. Now. It's the moment that dam started to break. Um, because, you know, the books of blood have full-on gay content, and that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. And And that's... I'd say at first, um, but somebody will know earlier examples, but it, it's the first time that hits the mainstream in horror. And, you know, that's hopefully 
that's kept going and the, the thread is still continuing. Um, I'm not actually in, aware enough of the genre detail of horror um, to, to know whether it has. Um, the, the business of, of how genres change and interact and evolve is one of my favourite subjects, but I'm, I'm not a horror expert, so I don't know what's down there in the, in the fine detail of horror. What what genres would you say to that thing of genres sort of interweaving this? What other genres do do you sort of find fascinating in this sort of, you know, the way they interweave and um, evolve? Well, um, the interaction between the literary novel and science fiction I find fascinating, um, from Brian Aldiss to William Gibson. Mm. I I think that... um, there's a whole parallel world where all of science fiction continued to develop off into the new wave in Britain, its different forms in Britain and America with Moorcock and Ellison. And um, we just kept on having more Christopher Priest. And we never had that moment in the late 70s, early 80s, where all the big guns of golden age science fiction came back and got bestseller status. And suddenly the publishing trade thought, oh, actually spaceships. Yeah, um, it's, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not literature. Um, it's not a cutting edge modernist literature. It's spaceships. And uh, suddenly we were all back to that. That is quite. A, actually, that's a really. Sorry, that's quite a surprising thing because you say you you know we talk about the horror boom of the seventies and you know the splatter point, but then there's obviously paperback boom of sort of the late seventies and eighties as well. But considering that sci-fi was taken off on screen following Star Wars and even oh, yeah. Star Trek back to, to to say actually that's a really good point that actually there was never a sort of a you know the the same didn't seem to happen in sci-fi books in the same way. It's quite interesting actually. Well, well, the big boom in science fiction is immediately after Apollo. Mm. Um, when it looked like it might all be true. And Arthur C. Clarke is the bestseller who wait, rides that wave of I'm the prophet of Apollo and here I am writing science fiction novels that feel like they could come true very soon. Certainly, in the wake of Star Wars, we do get another SF publishing boom. Um, but as I say, it's all the Golden Age guys coming back. Incredibly, even Philip K. Dick's Valis, his last novel, which was barely a novel, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary piece. But what it isn't is the kind of thing that got, as it did, an embossed cover, um, and um, which made it look like um, the, the, this was another big-time spaceship blockbuster. Um, <laughs> it, um, people who bought that on that basis must have been really puzzled. <laughs> but... Um, I'm, I'm Gibson is possibly Gibson and Christopher Priest put together are my two favourite authors I think and um, Gibson is uh, so much in conversation with the literary mainstream as was Ursula Le Guin um, and I I really appreciate that what's the word more academic approach that we are we are not afraid of uh, to be labelled literature. Um, somebody um, like Neil Gaiman recently, um, I think Gaiman's genre image is fantastic. And he, I think, kind of stumbled into it and then grabbed it and formed it and decided upon it in a really, really clever way. That is to say, he is about story. He is the prince of story. So he can tell lots of different sorts of story. He is, in effect, his own genre. There's very few people who get to do that. You know, Stephen Donaldson, uh, enormous bestseller, decides to write something a little bit different genre-wise, boom, loses half of that audience. This can happen to people. It's not going to happen to Gaiman, because he's already established that he can write picture book for children, Book of Norse mythology. He, the one thing he hasn't done so far is Dirty Great Spaceship. Um, he's gonna. <laughs> he will. <laughs> that, I, I've never thought about that as a point, as a, but that's really true. That, so, so Neil Game is one of those authors, I think, that I say, and it we the same people that will read, like I say, everything he puts out. I mean, you know, I, I can read Car- Coraline to my daughter, but then... I will happily read it itself, but then I'll go off and read like Neverwhere or, or, or um, American Gods and that sort of thing. Yeah. Ah. 
Cool. That's anyway, cool. sorry, but that, but I digress. Please. No, no, but that's a great answer. That's fantastic. I mean, this is, you know, it's about all the those sort of genres. So this, the last sort of section is genre fiction from childhood to adulthood. And we'll start with a simple question. So what introduced you to genre fiction? And that can, like say, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, that sort of thing. I think it was the boxes of books my brother left in the attic um, when I was growing up. My brother was the, it, off in Australia. He was this mythical figure. And he left in boxes in the attic the science fiction of W.E. Johns, the, the creator of Biggles, and also lots of Biggles books. Eagle Annual and the um, Eagle Annuals containing the wonderful Frank Hampson Dan Dare, and from the local library thus, because I got obsessed with the word science fiction. Oh, he also left long runs of things like Galaxy and Astounding, uh, the magazines, and because I got obsessed with the word science fiction, I started to borrow um, Hugh Walters' spaceship books from the mobile library and um, books like Dragon 5, Danny Dunn, um, lots of children's SF back then, uh, the works of Andre Norton, you know, uh, lots and lots of uh, entry drugs there. And of course, Doctor Who, which <laughs> rocked my world. I, w- I was scared of Doctor Who, I wouldn't watch it. And then I decided I had to as a rite of passage. And watching it, that safe scare slayed something inside me. And suddenly, well, you know, uh, the, hence hence my future career. The, uh, there's the comics, there's the prose, and there's the television. It was all very much of a muchness back then, um, especially the television. You, um, In books like um, uh, Fantastic Television, there was the canon. There was a Star Log book that listed all all science fiction movies. Uh, you felt that you could honestly see every uh, existing SF movie, and this was just prior to Star Wars. You know, I I I arrived in the midst of all this maybe two years before Star Wars happened, and so it was only after Star Wars that suddenly it doesn't look like you're not you're going to be able to see every <laughs> SF movie that exists. Also, The Outer Limits, um, late at night on BBC Two on a Friday night, was a major thing for me. So those are all my formative influences. And pulling them all together, uh, encountering three different fandoms, which I still struggle with balancing, Doctor Who fandom, science fiction fandom and comic fandom. As as a writer, I'm formed because of all these collisions between differing things. And so I suppose being very interested in the boundaries of genre is because I'm always trying to navigate them myself. Yeah, so I, I hope that's an answer as to where I come from. No, that's great. That's great. That's a really good answer. Thank you. Just, just a final question on that. So who is your Doctor Who? Who is your sort of, uh, you know, favourite or the one that... <laughs> Well, this is when you ask an actual Doctor Who fan this. This is the the answer to any question about Doctor Who to a Doctor <laughs> Who fan is discuss. Yeah. I like Peter Davison. I like like Sylvester McCoy. I think I would tend to come down on the side of McCoy. Mm. Um, in recent years, I'm starting to realise I really liked Peter Capaldi actually taking a dramatic j- journey uh, across three seasons and changing the character. And I'm incredibly excited by what they're doing at the moment so that's at least four i've named there yes yeah no i have to admit because i you know um i you know was it was a kid in the 80s born in 81 and and it was actually it was it was uh, mccoy's uh sylvester mccoy doctor who that really yeah that, that, that sort of i recognize and because it, it suddenly so many influences from other places that i knew you know mm. reading the same comics i did I was actually of an age where I sent a script to Andrew Cartnell at the Doctor Who production office um, with, I wouldn't say some chance of success, because this is several years before I actually got anything on television, but it was an actual script formatted properly. You know, it, was, it wasn't uh, me drawing stick figures on the back of an envelope. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but no, I was obsessed with, with Cartnell era Who. Um, and it, it informed an awful lot about, you know, that and Hellblazer running alongside each other. Mm. Basically the same trickster character, you know, it's... Uh... I have to admit, like I say, going back, because modern... I know it's going to be a quick... I'll wrap up and set the final question, but this is a, a bit of a 
tangent. Modern Who, I've watched all of it from, like you say, from uh, Eccleston through to Whitaker now. I, I think she's doing a great job. I really enjoy, you know, New Who. Jodie Whitaker, I think, is doing a great job. I think sometimes they sort of there's a tendency to be a bit too on the nose with some of the moralising, but I think that's well, sort of part I, I and think, parcel. I think I, I think on the nose is kind of where the general public on a Sunday night are. Yeah. Uh, that... uh, Ru- Ru- Russell always said to me that um, uh, Russell T Davis that um, you had to state things three times because somebody wouldn't be on the sofa with their tea yet, mm. and then they'd be talking and might miss it, and the third time you've probably covered all of them. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's the same as so in, in my sort of career. But whenever you do presentations, I'm always told you sort of you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, then you tell them what you've told them, just to make yeah. sure that it's really been sent home. But no, I think Jodie Whittaker's really got a great energy as um and you know going back and watching some classic who recently like uh, Davison and, and Baker and and McCoy, like I really can see. That like the people that like yourself and 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 Russell T Davis and others that have, have contributed to it like there is still like there is that connective tissue like you know you can see mm-hmm. those two eras but it's really it is really there and um so oh, yeah yes. so no, final question then so really the idea of, of genre fiction for kids so do you think it's important to introduce children to horror and sci-fi and fantasy ideas um at an early age oh yeah I mean carefully hmm. um. You know, um, when the age is apt, I think um, I'm. I have a uh, seven-year-old son, and he's not ready for Doctor Who. Uh, he, being autistic, he's. Um, you know, um, things can specific things can e- e- easily disturb him. He has actually watched some Doctor Who in that he got really into Resolution, the New Year's episode on the iPad. Um, but he would see it in little five-minute chunks that he controlled and kept coming back, well, two-minute chunks that he controlled and kept coming back to. Um, and so he started call. he saw my model Dalek and started calling it the Dalek voice machine. Because, of course, as far as he's concerned, a Dalek is that octopus thing. And this <laughs> strange metal thing is just its voice machine. But uh, apart from that, he's only experienced Doctor Who through the medium of fridge magnets. Um, and through stealing my Doctor Who magazine and, um, <laughs> and, and not actually reading it, but putting it on a table. But um, so he's aware of the words. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to him, him finding. Oh, we're, we're actually reading Neil Gaiman's Fortunately the Milk to him at bedtime these days. But um, I'm looking forward to um, to him finding his own sort of genre fantasy. No, I have to admit that like, my I've got, uh, my daughter's six, and um, I, I I didn't think she was ready for sort of Doctor Who, um, but then literally this 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 season, this new season, she sort of just uh, she came down one Sunday evening, sort of like just before she went to bed, saw it, and sort of just stood there and was like in awe for t- ten oh. for like ten minutes, and she was like, "What's this?" And I was like, oh, "It's Doctor oh. Who," and she was like, "She's just me." Doctor Who's a girl now, and I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, she, you know, she regenerates." She was like, "Oh, she's awesome," and then she went to bed. <laughs> so I she... think that's fabulous. So now... that, that that reaction has been copied so many times. Oh yeah, no, it was perfect. It was, I was like, "Oh, do you want to watch it next week?" She says, "Yeah." yeah. So, so this Sunday she'll be uh, she'll be staying oh, up it, and watching it, Doctor Who. I and... absolutely think it varies from child to child. Yeah, um, you know, I'm very aware of Tom's special circumstances. You oh, know. Yeah. Well, so, well, my um, my nephew's um, autistic, and um, you know, so I, I sort of, you know, we we work with him, and and he's very, very sort of fixated on um, the Marvel superheroes. Like they're they're his mm. jam, and and being like say the the geek that I am, he loves coming around. He sort of, he'll go into like my little, I won't say a man cave quite a thing, but he goes in and gets all the gets all sort oh. of the, the figures out, and sort of like I I, I I tell you my um my comic collection is um bagged and boxed mm. and i'm fi- i'm filling in gaps consciously thinking about tom mm. and he's he's kind of aware it's there he doesn't know what it is yet but i have very carefully kept it a secret to this secret room j- because then he'll feel that 
when he goes and discovers it, it'll be it'll be me like me in that attic. It'll yes. be a kind of Aladdin's cave. And um, I think I think a fandom, Doctor Who fandom or comics fandom or SF fandom is just waiting for him mm. because fandoms are very good places for autistic people. And I think that um, that that thing the general public kind of find difficult to deal with in fandoms although it must be said that everybody's allowed to be a fan of something now the, the mm. you know we we won about 20 years ago <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> you, you know uh, they, 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 we could now the door of the ghetto is sort of blowing open and shut all the time you could just wander <laughs> off if you want to <laughs> but um uh, that that thing that the general public feel about fandoms that they're um very autistic that's true in a very positive way mm. before i started to think about autism and before i started to think about my own autism because tom gets a big genetic component from me i think and, and i flap i have autistic flapping i had no idea what that was until tom came along i always used to say that going to science fiction conventions specifically sf fandom i had to spend a little time when i got there adjusting to the mode of speech there because it wasn't the general public mode of speech that I'd naturalized myself to and learnt um, as a second language. It was a very different thing where I say something interesting, then you say something interesting, mm. then I say something interesting. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, the, um, moving between the two is exhausting. You've got to <laughs> move, yeah. move your brain. You know? Yeah, I, I have to admit the, the amount of times I've been to a convention and things, and like you say, I often go on my own and I sort of just go to wander around and stuff. And you, like I say, I come back exhausted because you've bumped into someone just. As browsing through, you know, the long box or just sort of something, and you have a conversation, and you sort of like within, you know, you think it's taken minutes, and also you're like, oh my god, we've been talking for half an hour, and like you sort of, mm. yeah, I think there can be such a if good, it, great atmosphere it, in this place. If I'm not, if I'm not careful, if I haven't translated my brain back between the local pub and SF convention, mm. I think about SF conventions. Why aren't these people being kinder to each other? Yeah. And I think about the local pub. Why are they all talking about trivia? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah. It's the worst of both worlds. Um, <laughs> must, must, must be said, Doctor Who fandom and comic fandom, their own specific flavours. You know, the, the, these three fandoms are very different to each other. Mm. I think the one thing that sort of sours it all is that, that, is that there's a, that vocal minority that you get usually on social media that, you know, just want to, I don't know, spoil the fun, for, for want of a better phrase, really. Uh, Twitter is people. Yes. Twitter, you know, social media <laughs> is just what people are really like. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But, Paul, that's been fantastic. I really appreciate uh, you spending the time. Thank you. OK, well, ladies and gentlemen, there was my interview with Paul Cornell. I really enjoyed talking to Paul, and the fact that he was willing to talk about his son and everything about Doctor Who uh, was wonderful. I really enjoyed it, and it was, it was just fascinating to, to talk to the guy. Uh, and uh, I hope one day, touch wood, fingers crossed, we'll get him back on the show, uh, and maybe to talk about Doctor Who, get a bit more in-depth, maybe see what else we can find out. But in the meantime, we are still in this episode, and we've still got another interview to go. Uh, so I'm now going to go straight into, same question, same setup, but with Stephen Volk, and uh, let's see what he has to say. So as I say, the first sort of area is evolution and acceptance of horror as a mainstream genre. So do you think that from its origins or so its growth through the 20th century and everything, that it has become more accepted, more socially acceptable to uh, like horror? Hmm, let me think about that. Do you mean the general population? Yeah, so in the mainstream. So has it become more accepted in the mainstream over the years, in any form? So books, TV, uh, games, uh, you know, what are your thoughts around horror in the mainstream? I th I, for me, horror has really, the, the path of horror from, let's say, the 80s as, as kind of the, the path has forked to a certain extent, okay? And I think post Jaws, let's say post Jaws um, and uh, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, the blockbusters, the multiplex um, mentality of the marketing push that goes into making hit films. Yeah, there's a, there's a split in horror 
and in one um, along one path it goes into action thriller territory which is more commercial more pleasing the audience the other one the other route i would say is my angle on horror which is not about pleasing the audience which is about disturbing the audience okay mm. so you have something on the one path which is the mummy you know chock full of special effects um you know exploding corpses um decaying things plagues of locusts but it's basically a fun kind of romp van helsing is another example or that terrible remake of the haunting with the flying babies you know those kind of things but not that's taking it to extreme i do think there are crowd pleasing entertainments that are mainstream i probably would say it goes in that category the recent two two films in the it franchise i probably would say most of the bloom house films and i probably would say even dr sleep is in the commercial cinema category on the other path is um, some, I would say, more interesting or certainly more diverse and more subversive transgressive fare, which is the kind of horror that gets under your skin and genuinely gives you nightmares as opposed to a ghost train ride. Um, and I, uh, I'm sure I think of some examples as we go along, but um, say mm. something like, just because it springs to mind, the lighthouse or the witch um, really madcap or the invitation a really disturbing kind of psycho psychodrama or a dark song which was a kind of a cult thriller that was done um, in Ireland the, the kind of more offbeat indie type uh, films that, um, that as I say um, go for that idea of being transgressive and being difficult to shake off as opposed to sheer commercial entertainment brilliant <clears throat> no you know yeah three things i also think also, i really enjoyed like, the witch and, and the lighthouse and uh, i think it's like hereditary as well sort of oh uh, yeah yeah uh, sat in that sort of camp so this was like that ariasta sort of um yeah 24 sort of uh seems to be standing yes out. actually those are good examples of they're not quite in one or the other i think they would be mm. more in the subversive um WTF kind of camp rather than straight commercial. Although the the interesting thing now, of course, with uh, Hereditary, Babadook, um, that kind of thing, um, is is the auteur directors actually make films that in turn become hits. Um, mm -hmm. A different level of budget than the big blockbusters, obviously. But but um, you know, I th I think what the future holds will be really interesting in that respect. Yeah, no, definitely. Look, there's some, uh, I think, some interesting films can come out of those uh, directors. So, in that sort of, since that sort of period, then, do you think that um, in, in accommodating or in accepting these, or whatever, do you think society has changed as well? As, you know, as people's view on these things changed, or is it just um, the way that they've sort of separated? And, and uh, I think, um, I think, uh, fantasy, horror, and science fiction. Or, or let's think fantasy and horror in particular, have become more explicit. I mean, the levels of violence, for instance, and the the things that special effects can achieve on screen has become so much more in your face than it could be even 15 years ago that they, they've actually become so visceral uh, by the very nature of we can do it, that's, therefore let's do it kind of thing uh, nobody, se nobody seems to think we can do it but let's not do it kind of thing you know uh, it, it's it's just become fling everything at the uh, in the extreme so it's become a, a cinema of the extreme to a certain extent but whereas I think the game culture fantasy culture and horror have become something that's very um, to a certain extent as you say mainstream in that there's a huge audience for it I do think that there's an audience that will never go to those things because they do not want to be exposed to violence and they do not want to be horrified as a form of entertainment. Okay, you could say a lot of those people are um, a kind of older age group than a younger age group. But even so, I don't think it necessarily breaks down always like that. I think there are certain people that are sensitive to 
the kind of dramas that me and you and people like us find exciting and don't have a problem with the extreme or transgressiveness of other people I know from personal experience cannot bear the thought of being even slightly disturbed by something I mean even something you know I don't the, the weird thing is that we all have different limits I, I for instance have never been bothered by decapitations or any of the silliness like that or a stupid film like brain dead you know where someone with the character you know throws a, a you know rotates with a lawnmower and mm. takes heads yeah. off the zombies that kind of thing the peter jackson um i've never been bothered by that because it's so ridiculous as to be you know absurd um uh, and implausible but you know one thing i can't stand is seeing a hypodermic needle go in someone's arm I just have to look away because that's somehow more within our personal experience. So something that is that is um, more to do with reality and say, for instance, I still cannot bear someone walking down the street and a, a bunch of people ganging up on them. That kind of bullying scene or violence of the mob against one person. I find really hard to take, even though I can take all manner of or other sorts of horror, because I think there's an element of reality about it that really makes it difficult for me. But so there will always be that people that will not go as far as that. I mean, my wife, for instance, likes kind of uncanny horror and ghost stories, creepiness, atmosphere. She doesn't she she doesn't like elements of violence, zombies, walking dead, that kind of thing. I kind of twisted her arm, and not literally, to watch Walking Dead because I said it's all about the characters. And I think in in the end, um, she came to realize it's about the characters' survival that you care about, not about the zombies. But even in that case, I think the relentless piling on of CGI effects and blood spatter, you know, got to her uh, in the in the end. It wasn't worth the journey, you know. But mm. that's, uh, that's just a specific example. I do know you know different types of people, though. It's um, as you say, sort of. I'm sort of like attracted to this and all you know, all those different kinds. And then um, even when sort of uh, you know people I work with or something will say that, oh, you know, what have you watched? Or you do anything exciting this weekend? You say, oh yeah, watch this film. And you sort of you get animated about it and you're explaining it, and then they're like, why? Why do you watch that? That's so like you know weird. <laughs> yeah. you know, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> my, my brother is uh, my brother's a, a teacher, and he's had this great conversation in the staff room that he overheard, where one of the other teachers um, said that they'd gone to see Godzilla, and they said, uh, "Yeah, it was a good film, a little bit far fetched, though." <laughs> I thought that was the most ridiculous statement. You know, to say Godzilla is a bit far fetched. I don't think they've got the point really. Um, no, yeah, it's all about <laughs> levels, really, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, what what do you think has had the biggest impact on the changing face of genre and acceptance of it um you know in the past sort of uh, century or so century my gosh um well i think let's talk around this because i may not be answering it in, in the right way you know um um horror reflects what goes on in society i think that's without a doubt there was a wonderful documentary about the influence of um george romero's um night of the living dead um saying how that reflected the uh, climate of the times and how um you know the reds under the bed mentality spawned invasion of the body snatchers i i you know i think you can you can very 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 easily do a catalog of the big or not even the big the general horror films of any decade and relate it to um, the social mores of the time. I mean, uh, you know, for instance, Hammer films, which at the time just seemed to be, uh, how would you say, Manichaean kind of fights about good against evil. When you look at them now, it seems really obvious to me that they're about threats to fatherhood. They're always about fathers trying to protect their daughters from uh, the hedonistic lifestyle of the 60s in some symbolic form. There's always Peter Cushing or someone of Peter Cushing's age um, trying to fend off someone of um, uh, more more kind of um, powerful sense of virility um, 
and uh, saving someone's virtue. You know, it's, it seems to be quite moralistic, even though even though in the guise of a kind of gothic fairy tale. Um, so you can you can definitely look at these look at these um, stages in the evolution of horror. And I think you can see them as a, a real, really interesting kind of mirror of what's going on in, in society. But your question was... Um, uh, what's how, had the biggest impact on the changing face of genre acceptance? Uh, genre acceptance, acceptance. Um, genre acceptance. Um, genre acceptance. Um, 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 um. I, su I suppose it has, hmm. I think you're guiding me towards saying it's been accepted into the mainstream. So I'm kind of going back to my first answer, which is, which is that some of it has, some of it has been accepted into the mainstream. So you get, for instance, Gothic adventure series like Penny Dreadful, uh, which nevertheless can be scary and can be, you know, was a really good horror product. Um, but wasn't necessarily the stuff of nightmares um and you had many things like for instance you know vampires and dracula being re um re assimilated into the into the mainstream different versions of them with different angles on why they seem to be socially relevant some of them spurious some of them obvious but you know vampires never really go away they just you know it's just fodder for journalists to say that they're you know why? Why or why have vampires come into the, the uh, public consciousness all of a sudden? Mm. They, they haven't gone away at all ever. You know they just <laughs> just peaks and troughs. Um, so what? I'm trying. I'm circling around trying to give you a, an effective answer here. What has? Mm, I think one of the things when you. I think it's, it's something to do with the. It's something to do with actually. Let me give you this answer the acceptance of horror i think is to do the with the availability of horror in the middle of the 20th century because before that time i mean when i was growing up i couldn't see x films because i was simply too young and you could only go to the cinema and see these in the cinema and you could only be a certain age to go in and see them um but when they became available when they were recorded um, on VHS and subsequently on DVD and then on streaming, increasingly they became av available to uh, a range of people beyond any certi certifica certification that happened to be on the DVD or VHS or whatever it was. It was actually out in the world and could be seen by a wider range of people. And I think that made it available to a younger audience who was always drawn to these things because they're kind of forbidden fruit and they play with ideas that are to do with testing your limits psychologically and morally and and setting you on a journey about what you think about the world, what you think about a sexy son of a bitch like Dracula. Do you want to be Dracula or does he scare your pants off? Is he a monster or is he a kind of a hero? You know, horror is always throwing these questions at you as an adolescent. So adolescents now could start to see the things that were about these really powerful urges within them, which are all, what horror, horror is all about, is about deep psychology uh, and the unconscious, okay? So all the tropes that are in horror and all the monsters that we create out of horror that have any meaning and any longevity in culture are to do with tapping into the unconscious, to do with writers and directors tapping into their individual unconscious, um, or con or constructing them in uh, out of out of ideas of the unconscious that have gone before. There's a absolutely straight line from, you know, 19th century Gothic literature through Freud to psychoanalysis to into horror films, you know, and you can trace that. It's as uh, it's as clear as the nose on a werewolf's face, you know, um, and, um, you know, but I think if you want a straight answer and I've gone around the houses, I think it's about the availability of horror. I'm mainly talking about horror that what used to be X, X certificate until the sixties and then into the seventies, um, 
they started to become available in a different form and that the audience because of that widened some that some people like i say would never go and see it but that's that's another story no brilliant perfect and thank you um okay so um i have on representative social fears and concerns but you've actually you nailed that one as well really. so that's a really <laughs> good answer, so perfect um <coughs> the next bit really is uh representation in genre fiction so again this is sort of like you know um the, the standard mode obviously this thing about you know the sort of the, the straight white males but um so do you think do you think has genre fiction been in any way at the forefront of representation in fiction or is it had an adverse effect on representation okay i think the accusation that's always leveled at horror by people that don't understand or like horror is that it's fascist sadist sadistic it appeals to our sadistic urges and it's kind of fascistic and it glorifies the horrible things and you know why on earth would you want to put yourself through that or put anyone else through that experience you must be perverted and therefore evil um i actually think the complete opposite i think horror is a force for good because it's a force of of the light because it's it basically tells you when you walk out of the theater or switch off what you've been watching life isn't quite as bad as it could be okay mm. <laughs> so you've seen something really awful hopefully in the process it's shed a light into some of the dark corners of human nature uh you know by the nature of monsters or or what they are but be they um evil monsters or or pathetic to be pitied etc etc but basically at the end what it does is it it shows you that you know things can be bad and can be survived and even if the characters in the drama don't survive you have survived as the viewer therefore you are stronger than them um i mean basically for me horror is cinema or the drama of anxiety and it appeals to people that feel that they are not in control of the world therefore we like to see and i include myself quite blatantly in that we like to see drama that shows us what it feels like in our heads which is that everything under the sun is frightening therefore we like a mode of theater that reflects that and it makes us feel secure to know that other people feel like that that the world is a frightening place even if we're told stories in a poetic form in a symbolic form um that's why it's it's for me a uh, genre that's not harmful as some people portray it not degenerate as some people want to label it but one of self knowledge and enlightenment and integrity to a certain extent about tackling certain things about um the human problem like it great thank you <laughs> I'm just, i don't know where i'm going with these thoughts they just no, coming good. Off. i love it it's, <laughs> it's, it's pure thought which is which is what i like it's sort of you know it's honest and it's honest and uh, um covers what we're talking about so it's fantastic so do you think that based on that then do you think genre fiction can be used and is used to subvert social norms i think i do think that is part of the prime um potency of horror is subversion i think there's a anarchy is another word i would use um and and especially that overlaps on on a genre that i really like called black comedy or dark comedy i think they use it now rather than black comedy meaning Eddie Murphy it's dark comedy okay which is which is you're not sure whether you laugh or it's horrible like like the leg going into the wood chipper in Fargo yeah mm. um it's kind of like horrible but truthful i think i think dark comedy is the most kind of truthful thing because i don't know we you know we don't always have extreme experiences in life but when we do have very emotive experiences that are uh that kind of get our teeth on edge there's often something quite comical at the same time if you think of when we go to funerals there's there's often something so bizarre 
that it almost makes you kind of laugh at a funeral, you know. And um, but back back to um, back to horror. I think horror is is really about subversion, and that that is the kind of joy of it. I'm I'm writing something at the moment that is very transgressive, um, and a lot of people would say, "Oh, you shouldn't do that about that kind of character," you know, the kind of the kind of story police that are out there. Or you can't have that person do that. That's the one thing you can't do in a story. You know, it's kind of save the cat mentality. And of course, you know, I don't see the point in being a, a writer if you're going to listen to that kind of directive that says, no, you can't do it. I mean, the whole point for me of coming up with a story is to go into an area that challenges what people expect. And so in some ways challenges me as a writer to say, you know what, I'm going to take that really awful character and make you like that person mm. and even smile when that person's on screen even though I'm going to tell you what they've done is really terrible and I'm going to show you what they're going to do next is really terrible that for me is maybe fun is too strong a word but that is kind of the game of true horror I think to a certain extent is to actually churn up those waters if that makes sense and get people to to, to you know it's not it's a completely different impulse to comedy, which is really to let people, even kind of like spicy, kind of nasty comedy, is basically there to make you feel better. You know, leave the theatre with a smile on your face. Horror yeah. is one genre where you don't want to have the emotion that it promises, which is to be horrified and upset and maybe disgusted. Okay, who on earth wants that? So it's the one genre of all the genres that that is against human nature to a certain extent, which is why a lot of people don't like it and can't find the logic of why anyone is interested in it. But for for people like me and writers like me, it's it's kind of what makes it really vital and interesting, because it goes against what you would do for enjoyment and what you would what you would kind of read or see for enjoyment. Um, yeah, I like that. <coughs> Sorry, I'm holding the coffee. Um, no, I'm not, I, totally, I, say, I totally know what you mean by that as well. Was, um, um, I'm, I'm currently reading a book, um, a collected short stories of an author called Thomas Legati, and um, Oh, yeah, yeah. They're really sort of... Uh, the, the tone and the sense of it is very disturbing. Yeah. Um, but I can't get enough of them. I think they're so... Good. They are, you know, like you said before, they get under your skin. Yeah. And they really make you sort of like, you know, really sort of... Um, have you read um, Adam Neville? I have. I've, yes, I've read... Um, um, I think I joined as everyone else. So I read... He did The Ritual, didn't he? The Ritual, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've read that. Um, very good. Um, that, yeah, some of his books are... Um, I liked um, House of Small Shadows. That's a really bizarre one. That that, that really creeps you out. Oh, I'll try that one, yeah. <laughs> I got... Because I collected... I got some of his... Uh, I got on Kindle, I got some of his short stories. So quite... I find the Actually, of... Adam would be good to talk to, uh, you know, with all due respect to, you know, I shouldn't suggest people to you, but I'm, a Adam is very good about, um, you know, the kind of stuff that we're talking about, and I think he'd have a really interesting angle on it. I did reach out to him, actually. He wasn't available. When I, cause obviously, for the first bit of oh, okay. Event, he wasn't available, but uh, I do need to reach out to him again, actually, because, yeah, I, I, do, I really do enjoy his work, actually, so he would be good, and um, so I, I will be trying again. Uh, but yeah, no. If, if you say if you're, if you're recommending him, I'll definitely try again. Um, okay, so last section, so we can round this out. So really, this is, this is genre fiction from childhood to adulthood. So really, so much from a sort of more personal point of view. What introduced you to genre fiction? Oh right. Well, for me, it began with comics. I think to be to be honest with you, I um, I used to always spend my pocket money at a local newsagent. And uh, I used to buy Spider-Man and Marvel, you know, Fantastic Four, those kind of things. And then I would pick up, um, I think, I don't know whether they were Marvel, but they were, they were classics illustrated, you know, things like Call of the Wild or Moby Dick or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I mean, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that's already getting into kind of science fiction and that kind of thing, you know, or the Odyssey, you know, with... Um, with the Cyclops and it, you know, those great kind of covers that catch your imagination when you're about five or six years old. <laughs> and, and then, um, and then I, at, at the fatal, the fatal um, watershed for me was picking up a copy of famous monsters of Filmland, and uh, echoing something that we just talked about. Of course, all these, 
uh, I'm, to- I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, about 1960, I suppose now. Um, yeah, around that time. And th- this magazine would come out. And of course, all the films in it were you know, universal films or films of the 50s with Vincent Price, that kind of thing, or the first Hammer films. But um, you'd see these stills. But of course, there wasn't any way I could see any of these films. It was physically impossible because I was you know, way underage. But so the, so the actual stills in this, in this magazine were absolutely mind-blowing because your imagination would see a picture from um, Mario Bava or something like that, or even Ed Wood, you know, um, or, or you know, a cra- crazy, mad uh, silent movie or um, Phantom of the Opera or something like that. Um, and you, you'd think, oh, I can't wait. If that is a still from it, my God, I can't wait to see the actual film, you know. So, um, so I think that was that got my imagination going. Um, and, uh, and then I think as I got into reading books rather than comics, I, I started to get books of short stories like the pan book of horror stories, uh, which I'm sure almost everyone that you speak to will have grown up on those, you know, and, uh, and through those, you start to read M.R. James and Edgar Allan Poe and Conan Doyle's kind of supernatural stories or Arthur Macken. Um, so those start to be really kind of exciting. And I suppose into my teens then I started to read um, novels and and that kind of thing I mean I'm I'm old enough to not get to Stephen King until I'm way into my horror kick um, because Stephen King kind of came post Exorcist didn't he I mean Carrie mm. was around by the what about early early 70s around the same time as the Exorcist in a way yes. so that was that was in a way my, my horror um, fixation obsession was already in place by then because by the mid 60s I was already watching sneaking into the cinema to watch Hammer films like uh, The Devil Rides Out or The Quatermass and the Pit that kind of thing you know or Double Bills or really by then anything with that kind of vivid kind of imaginative quality you know I wasn't that interested in although I did like I did actually go and see you know Lawrence of Arabia or those those kind of any any movies you know and I was obsessed with things like you know whatever it was on TV be it Lone Ranger or Bonanza or any of those things I mean it basically just just absorb everything at that age I think between about between about eight and twelve I think it just all goes in really um, and it probably took a while for me to realize that you know because I got into science fiction I got into a bit of crime fiction you know Sherlock Holmes and that kind of thing. Um, so it, it takes a while, I think, in your teens to realize, you know, horror horror is the genre that, that gives me the, the, the biggest thrill, really. Um, so that that, like I say, happened in the uh, in my teens. And I went to I went to university, to art college. And then I think the other watershed moment was going on my own on a wet Wednesday afternoon to watch a double bill of The Wicker Man and Don't Look Now. And I think I think that was a pretty big that was a pretty big moment for me both those films, um, so that 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 really made me think that actually I tell you what that made me think that made me think this genre that I that has always I'd always been told was kind of low rent and rather not very good and kind of childish and a bit rubbish because it was all B movies and you know that kind of thing it's to be looked down on you know. And when I saw The Wicker Man and Don't Look Now, both brilliantly directed and brilliantly written, as I'm sure you'd agree, I just thought, you know what? I'm not going to be embarrassed about loving horror anymore. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to start running away from it and pretending I'm interested in something else, because these people have made a film with with all the attention to to storytelling, character, you know, the craft of screenwriting, the craft of cinematography. And they haven't been ashamed that they're they're in the horror genre, um, or, or at least you know they haven't balked at the idea that that's what they're trying to do is scare you and be subversive in 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 both cases. Um, so I thought you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna run away from it. What I'm gonna do is do as much as I can as well as I can, and get better at it. That's the thing to get as good as Nigel Neal, to get as good as you know Steven Spielberg when he made Duel. Or Jaws, you know. The thing is not to, not to pretend you're not interested in that. Find what you're interested in and just concentrate on it, and 
you know, really go for it. That that's what that taught me. Excellent. I love that. I love the fact you mentioned uh, like Emma James and Arthur Mackin as well. It's uh, um, I think like, weirdly I feel like Emma James has had a bit of a like a mini resurgence. Um, oh, because Mark, through Mark Gatiss. Thanks yeah, to Mark it, on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I sort of heard it and I sort of I, I got um, you know his the the Emma James that first collection and and I've obviously I've sort of read all of them now, but. It, it, it becomes a gateway. I tell you, they're great to, but but just uh, by the by, they're great to listen to, a bit yes. like Sherlock Holmes stories. They're actually, if anything, better to get a recording of, because they are kind of like, you know, nestled down at the fireside and hear someone telling you a tale. You know, uh, well, there's a wonderful guy called um, uh, Robert Perry. Robert Parry, I think his name is. I was, I was about to say about him as well. Yeah. Uh, have you seen Have you seen him on stage? He does I've a brilliant. Seen him on, I've heard I've heard his recordings. Yeah, um, he does it. I mean, try and see them on stage because he's so brilliant at doing them. He just he just kind of talks to the audience. And I, I actually did a mammoth stint of I think three seeing six in a row on one day <laughs> in Bristol. Just like a double bill, then another double bill, then another double bill. Yeah. Or six in a row, and it was his skill is amazing. I really, it's really, life. really good. Yeah, it's, 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 I think it's something I will try and do because it's, it's um, let's see, I've heard recorded it is, it's fantastic. But uh, mm. yeah, no, James always has acted like a bit of a gateway thing to me because it's sort of like I started reading that and I thought, oh, I wonder if there's more. And it sort of opened up this sort of um, yeah, mi missing sort of a part of English horror history. So I'm sort of like you said, like uh, in Arthur Mackin, I didn't realize how much Conan Doyle wrote. I've started to read like uh, E.F. Benson, um, yeah. And, and, uh, all these others, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, they don't sort of get. I don't think they get the praise that they sort of. Uh, uh, I've never heard of uh, like William Hodgson as well, and sort of the Karnaki um, stories. Yeah, yeah, been, yeah. Uh, recently, yeah. so his novels I find a bit difficult and a bit dense, to be honest. But the short stories are good. Yes, I, 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 I agree with that actually. But uh, yeah, um, okay. Final question. So, so from your point of view, from what we said, obviously, you know, you said about you, you, your. Uh, uh, early life experiences. Do you think it's important to introduce children to horror and sci-fi ideas? As uh, let me think. Well, children should be should be uh, exposed to um, the genre that that they're drawn to. I do I do believe that the certification system for films is a sensible one. I mean, you know, no one would want to uh, show a young child, you know, a Serbian film or, or some of those films that are explicitly, you know, um, destructive and um, traumatizing, to be honest. I mean, God knows a lot of the films that, 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 that I like could be traumatizing and have been traumatizing. But you know, the weird thing, for instance, about when I... Um, some of the people that talk to me about Ghost Watch is that they come up to me and they say, oh, you know, that really traumatized me. I couldn't switch the light off for three weeks afterwards. I used to lie awake and I was terrified. And, you know, and then the sister standing next door to the guy would say, yeah, he really was absolutely terrified. But the guy would say, you know, I really suffered nightmares after that. But it made me want to make horror films and put something back in that I'd taken out of it. And I, I can't tell you how many times that's been said by people that were, quotes, not literally traumatised, don't get me wrong, but I would say in quotes, traumatised by the experience of, of, of Ghost Watch and say, I'm going on to really be interested in horror films. Because in a way, making horror films and writing horror is a kind of exorcism. I, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant about using that because I know that Stephen King said that it... That, you know, horror doesn't uh, exorcise, you know, um, mm. feelings. It exercises them. So you, you, it's kind of like a workout. It's not, uh, rather than getting rid of, of, of what of, of what you feel. You know, so I'm I'm very conscious what the master said on the subject. <laughs> but um, I've lost track of your this question now. I've gone off it. Uh, it was uh, uh, the importance of introducing children to... Oh, uh, children, right, okay. Let me, go back, let me go back to that. So I do, I do think the certification system is useful and necessary, but I do think because it's this, um, you know, theatre of anxiety, 
I think it is a, in a weird kind of way, a safety net for youngsters. I wouldn't say you know ch children necessarily, but youngsters to come to terms with what frightens them and what they find um, terrifying. It's it's a way of understanding things that they maybe can't put into words. Um, and it's a way of saying things, seeing things played out in symbolic form. I think that's the, that's the whole value of the genre in a way. Um, but we have to be careful because, uh, I, you know, nobody, nobody wants to, um, you know, deliver harm to um, vulnerable uh, people. But then again, there's always been a history of in horror of people on high, the kind of um, Mary Whitehouse kind of witch finders. Of the of culture, turning around and saying, "Oh, you know, it wouldn't harm me, but there are a lot more vulnerable people out there who it would harm," you know, which is incredibly patronising and all the rest of it. So that exposes a lot of hypocrisy along the way if you're not careful. Um, but um, I think there's a. I think most people have a sensible idea about what to, what age to expose their kids to, things that they are interested in and also um, kids want to be tested uh, my grandson was desperate to see um, and I can't remember which one it was but one of the prequel Star Wars films because he wanted to he was into Star Wars at that age and he was only about five I think five or six and he enjoyed the whole thing until young Darth Vader or Anakin Skywalker uh, fell into the volcano and his face started burning and he screamed and ran out of the room and I, I was really apologetic and he said he, got, he was in tears and I said oh I shouldn't have let you watch it and he said no it was my fault because I wanted to watch it so I think you've got that thing kids want to watch these things even and if it isn't that thing that upsets them it'll be something else yeah. you know when I was a kid I got terrified but of all things by uh, a Laurel and Hardy film called The Live Ghost where a drunk falls into a vat of white paint and then as he's staggering off Laurel and Hardy think he's a ghost and but that was incredibly creepy to me aged whatever I was probably five or something um, you know and I can remember storybooks where I, I resisted turning the page because I know there was that horrible picture on the next page that would give me nightmares you know and if it you, do, you know you don't know things that are going to upset kids it can be something completely innocuous that gets under their skin so in some ways in in the way that you know uh sometimes not washing and building up resistance to bacteria i think maybe early exposure to horror film <coughs> you know builds up kids resistance not to, not to horror in in real life but maybe builds up a kind of resilience to their own fears I never thought about it before, but that seems to make sense. I think to a certain, to a certain degree. I like that using sort of certain, you know, early age horrors like a vaccine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's good. <laughs> Excellent. That's brilliant. That's really. That's all the questions I've got. So, um, right. I'm, I really appreciate that. Well, hard listen, hard. as you as you as you get more, if you wanted anything clarified or get back get back to me, it's been nice chatting. No, I will do. I really appreciate it, Steve. Thank it's you. all right. It's uh, good fun. I'll, I'll let you know how it gets on. All right, then. Great. Keep in touch. Thank you. Will do. Right. Cheers, Bye. Steve. Bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. My interview with Stephen Volk. Uh, wonderful guy, great guy. Um, please do check out his uh, writings. You can find him online. Uh, he's very active in social media, on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, and also, I think PS Publishing have done an awful lot of his work Um recently uh really worth it especially actually when there's, there's a book called the dark masters trilogy in which he gives stories of um let me try i've got it right here next to me i'm gonna check it was uh, a story of peter cushing of um there you go peter cushing this is ridiculous but i've said it now so i'm gonna stick with it uh peter cushing um alistair crowley and alfred hitchcock so fictional stories, based, fictional stories based around real events that happened to those gentlemen uh, at some point in their life. So really good book. Um, anyway, that was just the first of those two interviews. Uh, so there will be further ones in the next episode. I'll get those edited and sent out 
in two weeks. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know what your thoughts are. Has this been worth it? Have you enjoyed it? Have you found it interesting? Is this something worth doing again? We will be doing something similar to this on the Patreon, actually, uh, which I'll talk about now. So this 20th Century Geek does have a Patreon page. We like to keep the lights on here at 20th Century Towers. Uh, and on that, there is a podcast, a monthly podcast called 30 Minute Thoughts, in which I give my thoughts on a topic uh, for 30 minutes. It's short and snappy. Um, that The topic of that podcast is voted for by the patrons. They sort of get the access to do that. Uh, a, a tier above, they also get to vote for what I get to do on the main feed. So on this feed, on the main podcast, you will get to vote on uh, different topics to see what I do each quarter. So four times a year, you'll get to vote uh, on what I do on 20th Century Geek. And a new thing we've just started to do in Creator Corner, uh, uh, once a quarter... Um, I will be talking to a uh, creative, uh, whether it be a writer or an artist or someone else, about something in particular that they're doing and their thoughts on things and the way it's going. Uh, and for this quarter, so as of November 2020, the first uh, creator I'll be speaking to is Kieran Gillen. And we're going to be talking about his current comic series with uh, Dan Mora, uh, Once and Future, uh, which is absolutely excellent. It's really good. So I highly recommend you go check that out as well. Um, but as I say, we've got a Patreon page to check that out. We have a sister podcast in Stories Out of Time and Space, where I'm joined by Julian Darius. Uh, and we talk about sci-fi movies every week. Uh, if you want to keep supporting the podcast, or both this one and uh, Stories Out of Time and Space, you can find us on Twitter. So we are at 20th Century Geek across Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And of course, uh, Stories Out of Time and Space is at Pod Time Space on Twitter. Please come and talk to us. We enjoy interacting with all of our fans okay ladies and gentlemen thank you for listening in i hope you enjoyed it uh, and you found those interviews interesting more will be coming in a couple of weeks uh, but in the meantime stay safe and uh, i shall see you soon mm-hmm.